Right, good afternoon and welcome to the Ask Me Anything session. I'm Balvinda Sidhu and I'm a presenter and reporter for ITV News Central. So I read the news during Good Morning Britain, which is obviously fronted by our very famous Piers Morgan. I'll be your host for today's session. And before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this week's event. It's been organised by the Royal Television Society in the Midlands and it's our most ambitious careers fair yet. This four day event has brought together people from across the world of broadcasting for six hours of live streamed sessions, masterclasses and workshops every day. Uh, we have to thank our sponsor, which is the National Film and Television School, which is a leading global institution who've developed some of Britain's most creative talent. Now, you can go to the RTS website, rts.org.uk, if you want to find out more about this event and sign up for sessions or catch up on anything that you may have missed. The hashtag is uh, RTS Careers Fair, so please do tweet uh, and talk about the event if you find any of it uh, wanting, if you want to talk about any of it. Um, so I hope you benefit from today's um, Q&A, pick up on some tips. We've got a really good, uh, panel uh, on this session, really uh, broad, experienced um, group of people. Um, and the good thing about the event is that you can ask any question. This is what it's all about. Ask any question you want to. So if you have a question, please send them through. They'll be filtered to me and I will put them to the panel. So let's get started. Right. Uh, we're going to go first uh, to Tracy Walker. She is a talent executive for ITV Studios North. Tracy, um, good afternoon. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you do? Hello, yes, how on earth do I follow that? Um, so I'm Tracy Walker, I'm the talent and resourcing, like, resourcing executive for ITV North. Um, so that covers a variety of labels, multi-story media, ITV Studios Entertainment, Man Possessed and Continuing Drama, Isabel will talk a little bit more about that shortly, um, and Provision. So we cover a whole range of skills or we're constantly looking for a whole range of skills. That's from costume dressers to joiners to exec producers and runners and everything in between. Um, the labels that we work with are uh, varied and wide and we make a whole range of shows from um, Manx in Mumbai to Tonight to Coronation Street and Emmerdale and a whole host of quizzes um, and I hope that gives a flavour. Oh, fantastic Tracy, thank you so much and as you mentioned we have Isabel Percy who you work with. Isabel tell us a little bit about your job. Hi, um, I work as a resourcing coordinator for the soaps so Coronation Street, Emmerdale and I also work across ProVision as well. As Tracy mentioned, we cover a broad range of roles. So anything from art department to uh, technical roles, um, script storyliner type roles. So um, there's a, definitely a broad range of skills that we look for and talent that we look for. I cover the more uh, formal side of recruitment. So all of our roles are advertised on the ITV job site. Um, and it's very much a, a formal recruitment process that I take care of. Fantastic. Thank you, Isabel. Um, next, we have Mel Adams, and she is a talent manager for BBC Sport. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm the talent manager for BBC Sport. Um, I look after the recruitment of uh, many of the roles across um, our output. So that's the whole of BBC Sport. So um, television events, um, online, digital, uh, radio, five live sport, so it's the whole the whole of BBC Sport. Um, we look after many different roles in the talent team. Uh, I myself mostly look after journalism roles, assistant producer roles, um, some graphics roles as well. Uh, other members of my team look after the other roles for um, BBC Sport. We also do some broadcaster online and on air um, roles as well. Um, most of what we do is, or most of what I do personally, is the formal recruitment, like um, Isabel was saying, so advertise the jobs on our Careers Hub website, 
um, and looking after all of the recruitment um, for those campaigns. Uh, but our team also looks after training and development and um, all that kind of thing as well. So that's what we do. Fantastic. It's really interesting. We've got a really diverse group of panel here from drama to sport. And uh, we've also got David, David Toms. He's a video editor for BBC Three. David, tell us about your job. Hi everyone. So yeah, um, as, uh, as you've heard, I'm a video editor at BBC Three is based in Birmingham. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, kind of format, uh, new formats, experimenting with formats and talent. And so I work across the content team at BBC Three Birmingham doing YouTube series, some I play series, lots of uh, social uh, stuff as well and trailers. So quite a broad selection of stuff. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's quite exciting that there is such a kind of big footprint of BBC Three in, in the Midlands, which I'm part of. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. And last but not least, we have Lena. Lena Hashway is a casting producer for BBC Three. Can you tell us a little bit about your job? Yes, yeah, so I work with David in Birmingham and um, I'm a casting producer. So we look at um, lots of uh, digital talent, everyone that's out on YouTube, on Instagram, you name it, TikTok. Um, we're always kind of uh, looking and churning who the next um, big talent is. And we do lots of stuff for YouTube, just like David said, so I don't want to repeat. Um, so lots of YouTube, lots of um, social first stuff. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder, you can ask questions, but please could you also um, add the name of the person you'd like to, uh, you'd like the question directed at. So without further ado, uh, let's go into the questions. Now, um, we have, um, so we've, we've got a lot of questions here. So already, oh gosh, uh, let me get, let me find the first one. So what is the best way to get noticed as a young filmmaker? So um, sort of who would be, Tracy, do you want to take that question? Um, well, I, I actually think um, either Lena or David might be better placed to to answer that because obviously they're looking out for for particular new talent. Okay. What I would say, just to just to jump in, is that we are constantly looking for new talent. Just be mindful in terms of standing out. Be mindful of the shows that you're applying to. So if you're applying to Mel and you say, I want to work on, I, I really love drama, I love writing, I want to work on Coronation Street, be mindful about who you're applying to and make sure you're not going to lie on your CV, but make, make sure you skew the skills that you've got to make the most of what you've done so far that's relevant to that particular production. Um, we do have apprenticeships at ITV. We have, uh, we hope to have some traineeships. We have huge amounts of ad hoc running work um, and we just can't seem to get enough of those at the moment. Um, that, that, that's all paid um, and we're constantly looking for new talent, which is why Izzy and I are doing this sort of outreach stuff because we constantly want to connect. I feel very quickly, if I should mention TV Talent North, which is a, a website that is dedicated to people wanting to work in the north of England. Um, and it's a, a collective of a range of broadcasters, all, all broadcasters and production companies actually, 26 of us in the north of England who have come together as a collective to engage with freelancers and support which it, during this time, which is particularly challenging at the moment for so many reasons um, and we just want to engage with people uh, we've just uh, uh, advertised a mentoring scheme so lots going on in that space you've answered that question brilliantly Tracy considering <laughs> that's perfect so Lena do you want to add anything to that we have got a lot of questions do you want to add anything to what Tracy said sorry was it what was the initial question <laughs> so what, what is the best way to get noticed as a young filmmaker I think honestly, I just think just just make your stuff, make your content. That would be um, that would be my biggest advice. Like, don't wait for money, don't wait for um, opportunities to come your way. Like, you have access nowadays that um, 
people didn't have 15 years ago. You've got access to YouTube, access to Instagram, access to just get your stuff out there and get it made and it's direct access and you don't need to have all these different channels. And if your stuff's good, then it will get noticed because people are always on the lookout for um, talented people and we're, I mean, David will tell you, we take a look at YouTube all the time um, in the same way that we inspire people. Um, we will look at stuff that will inspire us and, and um, we look at ideas and films all the time. So yeah, absolutely, just get your stuff made. Perfect. So the next question is a little bit about diversity. So I'm gonna just open that up to the entire panel. Somebody is asking here, should I directly address my ethnic background in a job ac application that is part of a positive action scheme? So does anybody want to take that uh, question? Because um, it's about people um, who are basically writing their ethnicity on an application as part of a positive action scheme to maybe recruit more people from a particular background. Shall I take that one? Okay. Um, I, and obviously I can only speak for ITV and, and our processes. So in a time when we are constantly thinking about how we make sure we don't discriminate, then we're moving towards perhaps not having a, much information on those shortlisted CVs. Um, and I'm referring to name on that. So, you know, we're being mindful about how we make sure that the best CVs based on skills, knowledge and experience get through. You refer to positive action schemes, that's slightly different in that that will be aimed at, a, at, at either a particular underrepresented group or underrepresented groups. And there will be some criteria for you um, to apply for those positive action schemes. Does that help? Well, I hope that has helped um, the person who asked that question. Um, and then the, the next question, similar to, it's, it's all about applications. How do people feel about having pictures in CVs? Does that help? Is it worth people including pictures as part of their CVs? We generally say, I can only answer for the BBC, we can, we, I would generally, generally say we wouldn't expect people to put um, photos on CVs if, unless they're applying for a role that's on, going to be on screen um, uh, but apart from, but other than that we wouldn't expect people to put a CV on their let's uh, put a photo on their CV. <laughs> Thanks Mel. And Tracy, BBC. Tracy what about ITV would you say that it's worth people putting CV yeah, pictures on? I, I'd say the same thing as well um, only you know we are really keen to hear from from everybody um, but that space is probably taking up a little bit of room where you could put even more skills and experience on there so yeah agree with Mel. Okay again I'm going to open this up to the panel again what soft skills are most desirable and which ones do you think shouldn't be mentioned in an application? I might pick this up first just because there's something that like particularly speaking from like an editing point of view and obviously there's like quite tangible technical skills that come with that um, one thing that I would avoid, especially something I think was a pitfall of mine early in my career, and it, it kind of comes from a place of, of you know, um, self-empowerment and recognising your own skills when you're at university. You're kind of taught that you're, you're you know, an all-rounder when you leave university a lot of the time. Um, and I think there's a bit of a disconnect sometimes between how you feel skill-wise coming out of a university course and how the industry actually would look at you. Um, so I would say in terms of not mentioning skills like calling yourself an editor director you know camera op anything like that straight out of university if you're looking to break in the industry is like a bit of a red flag um and i don't obviously how how the talent people feel in this in this panel but at least from what i've seen especially on a lot of kind of industry groups on facebook and stuff like that there's a lot of pushback when that happens and i think similarly as well when it comes to um, particular skills there's been a trend in recent years where people have put these kind of like knowledge bars on their cv that have like you know i'm 75 percent good at this and 50 percent good at that and it just kind of looks like you're just beefing your cv out unnecessarily and i think it's already been said here really like the more room you can put people to learn about you and your you know kind of soft transferable skills being a team player and all that stuff the better and less of the kind of more 
uh, hokey kind of like devices you might find. Believe it or not, people want to hire you, especially when you're entering the industry, whether or not you're going to be a nice person more than anything else and actually just like crack on with work. Um, so yeah, that's kind of just from my point of view, especially from kind of post-production. Lots of nodding there from Mel. Mel, I think <laughs> nodding and grinning. So yeah, I was going to say, do you want to add to that? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what David said. Um, I think for, for us, um, you've got to be a bit careful. The personal statement that people put on CV sometimes reads like they're kind of doing a, a sort of dating ad or something, you know, good sense of humour, that kind of thing. So like in the personal statement, it should be what you've done before, what three, three sentences maximum for us, what you've done before, what you're doing now and what you want to do. Um, the one thing I would say about soft skills is that some of our jobs, not all of them, but production management, you don't need to be mass massively passionate necessarily about sport, but a lot of our roles, we do want people to be interested in sport. So for some roles, particularly journalism ones, we do, we do want that. And so as a soft skill, that is a useful thing to say. And uh, Isabel or Tracy, do you want to add anything to that from an ITV perspective? Um, so I know when we recruit formally for um, runners and ADs, a lot of what we're looking for are soft skills because um, the people are entry level who are trying to get those roles or, or have had only a little bit of experience. So a lot of the soft skills that we are looking for, the main ones that we are looking for are the communication skills. So a lot of people are afraid to put on their CV that they've um, done waitressing or something like that. Um, but as long as you're highlighting on your CV that you know, you've got those brilliant communication and teamwork skills, we can see that it's really transferable um, and organisation skills, um, things like that. So I would say on your CV, don't be afraid to highlight experience that maybe isn't TV related and um, really pinpoint what skills and knowledge and experience you've gained from those roles. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Tracy, do you want to add anything to that or do you feel Isabel's covered that? I think Isabel covered that. Brilliantly. Um, and, and it is having that, I know it's, it's as old as the hills, um, but having that can-do attitude is, is really so important that, you know, we want you to come in, we want you to shine. It's not an exam, it's not a test. We want you to perform to your best, whatever that is. And, and you know, that, that's all we want from you, really. And obviously to learn, to progress, to build the skills that you need. But having that can-do attitude to start with is great. Fantastic. Uh, the next question. Um... Sorry, Velvet. Can I just share this? Because um, some, it's a new role that's come up. And, and who knew? And it just goes back to you never know when those skills that, you know, you did, I, I, you know, wherever come in useful. Um, but obviously, a lot of the a lot of the roles, a lot of the jobs that we have now are being done remotely, um, and we've got um, people who operate Zoom. So we'll be able to come in, make sure people are on the on the Zoom call with the right people at the right time, making notes. Who who would have knew? That's a new role to come out of COVID. Um, but those organisation skills are so important and those communication skills will be so important for that sort of thing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So that actually brings me on to the next question, which is, are you working on any new ventures or projects that are currently recruiting? So is there any recruitment opportunities at the moment? That's, that's always a really tricky one for us to answer because obviously... In, particularly in non-scripted, as soon as a programme or series is commissioned, we go into production, but until that point, it's all pretty confidential. I'd just say from maybe on behalf of the non-scripted members of the, the panel, um, that we are constantly in development with programme ideas, um, and we are constantly pitching to broadcasters um, with new shows and series. Um, and there will be a whole range of different shows coming up. Um, but I'm sure that Mel, and certainly with continuing drama, the clues in the title there, that, there's, that, that there is, you know, um, a, a jobs that come up regularly that are advertised on the ITV jobs pages um, for continuing drama that hopefully goes on forever. 
Okay, and Mel, do you want to add yeah. to that? Um, yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, I think, uh, and Valvinda, sorry. Um, I think, uh, from our point of view, our jobs that are external will be advertised on our career sub website. Um, if anybody wants uh, to set up email alerts, it will they'll get notifications when suitable jobs come up. We also have something called the BBC Cloud, where you can put your CV and your availability, and if any shorter-term roles that aren't being advertised formally uh, come up, um, then people can see when you're available and what your CV is, and uh, they can get in touch with you. And that's the whole of the BBC use that um, BBC Cloud. Okay, and one of the other questions linked to recruitment is: it is it okay? to send a direct email to talent managers in respect to work experience and a covering letter. So Mel, how would you respond to somebody sending you just an email saying, I'm looking at work experience, I'm interested in work experience at the BBC? Sure, so all of our work experience, we have we run a lot of work experience schemes and apprenticeships all the way across the BBC. Um, so what we would do is probably direct them to, to those links. Um, we can't sort of just informally invite people in because um, it, it basically needs to go through the proper process so that um, you know people are applying. Um, but uh, there are a lot of links and I'm happy to send on uh, to Danielle uh, from the RTS. I'm happy to send on all of our links for schemes and apprenticeships and she can make them available to people. But I think that would be really helpful, actually, to people to, to receive those links. And Tracy, would you like to add anything to that? Um, we sim Similar sort of thing, really. Um, but we, we do, we always welcome people to contact us. Um, the, there's, there's two sides to the way we recruit. There is the more formal recruitment process that we know what's coming down the line and we have time to be able to re recruit formally for it and then there's these very short turn turnaround commissions that are very limited on time um, that we have to crew up quite quickly um, and the the processes that we have all although robust um, have to meet those challenges um, in terms of work experience, um, obviously, again, COVID has interrupted those schemes and uh, we have to be really obviously monitoring, reviewing and, and uh, taking advice from health and safety. And for, for all the reasons you can imagine, not least that we're limited on numbers in our offices, sets and uh, studios, um, our work experience is paused at the moment. Um, but we're looking at online opportunities and we're reviewing for hopefully 2021. Yeah, COVID really has made things quite tricky, haven't they, for lots of reasons. Now, there's another question. It's from a school leaver. Um, they're in year 13. They're trying to find an apprenticeship. Um, any advice for them for a school leaver who wants to break into the industry? I would personally suggest, um, again, I can send the links for the schemes and apprenticeships we do. Um, they are, do tend to be quite competitive. So if someone's a school leaver, what, what I would recommend for anybody trying to break into this industry, which is very competitive, is to get as much work experience you can, whether it's at your local newspaper, your local radio station, um, anything at all that is related to the media that you can show on your CV that you've got that gone out there and got that proactively um, and not just that you have um, sort of uh, sort of media studies qualifications but you've also got that proactive experience to give you the edge as well that's what I would say. Lena you're nodding is it do you want to add anything to that? Yeah I say just jump in get as much experience as you possibly can and, and don't be picky when I first started I was um, I just contacted companies I asked when it work experience what I could do and literally just jumped into anything and everything that was going just to get some something solid on my CV so yeah I say just go for it contact companies get as much work experience as you can absolutely. Well, can you share can you share with us what your first work experience job was? 
Oh gosh. Um, so I, I'm from Montreal, Canada and I was a news reporter there. So when I moved here, I kind of had a switch in careers. And so when I first landed in the UK, I was doing lots of tempting jobs, but being in Birmingham, um, there was just a few kind of independent companies. So what I did, the first place I went to that I knew of was the BBC. So I pretty much contacted all the local BBCs around me and just did radio and TV like a week here, a week there. And eventually I um, landed at a small indie called Hotbed Media in Birmingham and they gave me a break and I, that I got my first junior researcher job. So it, it, and I think if it wasn't for all the work experience and the people that I had met um, doing work experience, um, I don't think I would have heard about this job or knew anything about it. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I say just jump in, just get as much experience as you can. What was the time frame like between you doing the work experience and getting your first job with this indie? Oh, you know what, it must have been a good year. So you have to, it was, it was quite, well, it was quite tough, I would say. You, you, I think stick to it. If you love it, people see that you, you're you dedicated and you love it and it's genuinely what you want. And like I said, I used to do a lot of work experience in between jobs until I, um, I gained a lot of experience. And then, you know, I would find out about jobs. I was freelance for a very, very, very long time. So yeah, it, it takes time, but stick to it. If you love it, stick to it. And um, and and I guess you'll know, your gut will tell you whether that's the kind of lifestyle that you want to have and you want to stick to it and you want to work really hard or, um, or not. So you'll know right away. But yeah, it does take time. But I say if you love it, stick to it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's quite an important message to communicate across is that it's not going to be an overnight thing. You, no. You're going to have to work and, and, you know, potentially be moving around a little bit before you get that first first break. Um, so um, we've covered sort of work experiences. There's quite a lot of questions around work. So I'm going to move on to something different now. Um, so what kind of things do you look for on the cv of someone who wants to work in television news broadcasting so is anybody here who kind of works in news i mean uh, we obviously we have sports news that's kind of slightly tenuous but does that help <laughs> so yeah i think i, I guess journalism. I can okay. talk about journalism and, and those kind of roles, if that's, I mean, I don't know if they mean on screen or... I think, I think so if we talk about journalism... Journalism in yeah, general. Yeah, journalism. <laughs> I mean, I work in news, but I don't recruit, so I don't, I don't <laughs> know what the... Hey, you can answer this one. <laughs> so, um, what would you say, Mel? Well, I would say um, in journalism, journalism um, we tend to like to... we. Uh, with a lot of our other roles we have, we don't necessarily need people, uh, we definitely don't need people to have degrees necessarily or to have gone to um, university. Journalism is slightly different and we do need people to have at least, you know, they need to know about media, media law. Um, so journalism is slightly different. We do often look for journalism qualification. Um, we do at uh, the BBC do a journalism trainee scheme, which is uh, quite an intense trainee scheme. But if if you know people can look when I send the, the links, people can have a look at that trainee scheme as well. Uh, but yeah, we do we do look for qualifications for that. But again, also I'd I'd try and get work experience. You know, even if it's at your local newspaper or or you know wherever um, or at your local radio station, just to get some experience. Um, some of the people start. They don't necessarily have a journalism qualification straight away, but they can join the company on a journalism uh, as a journalism researcher or journalism coordinator, which is the BBC's new job titles uh, for what used to be a broadcast assistant. Um, so you could join uh, in one of those roles and they don't always have to have journalism qualifications, uh, but that's kind of like the entry level role uh, in that industry, in that part of the industry. So I hope that helps. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can I can actually add to that because in ITV they have the news traineeship scheme, and they have something called the apprenticeship scheme, which are all um, you know set up specifically to 
bring in um, young people who want to get into the industry. So they have these, they release these every year. So I think, you know, the advice would be to follow the company on Twitter and they, they you know, everything gets shared online. So just keep, just keep across it. There are, those are the ways. And obviously a journalism course, a postgraduate course is helpful as well. Um, okay. So uh, question for Tracy. Um, do you have any tips on getting an apprenticeship? I've applied for so many without success. That's really hard to um, comment on people's individual uh, experience CVs and applications. So I, I couldn't um, I, I couldn't even begin to answer that question. What I will say is that as as you've just said, we have um, uh, ITV has apprenticeships, they have closed for this year um, and they are managed by our central recruitment team. So they will be looking for experience in whichever role. Uh, I know that there are a couple of runner, role, runner opportunities in ITV studios um, and they'll be looking for experience but a passion, a real passion for wanting to work on the shows that we produce. But without having sight of your application, the advertisement, the questions, it would be really difficult to comment on an, an individual basis. Okay, this is a question for Isabel. It's from Jacob Reason. Um, he's saying, what is the best way to get noticed as a screenwriter? I'm aware this profession isn't advertised as much as technical roles, but I'm wondering what is the best way to get noticed? Um, so we have a lot of um, storyliner roles that crop up um, multiple times throughout the year. I think we've had, had them this year. So um, they seem to be a really good way of getting into um, kind of like the editorial script side of things, whether that's in Coronation Street or Emmerdale. So um, I would say definitely have a look at that because I know um, when it comes to writing, they like to have had experience, people who've had experience from kind of like the producer side of things and also the storyliner side of things so if you've had that experience it really does you well um, and I would recommend applying for a storyliner position if, if it comes up on the ITV job site so um, like Mel said similar to the BBC we do have um, something where you can um, get notifications every time a job comes up on the ITV job site I'd recommend doing that keeping an eye out for roles in script departments um, applying for them and you can also submit pieces of your work um, writing um, uh, you know if you've, if you've got anything to that application and that always helps as well so I'd, I'd recommend doing that. Okay thank you Isabel. Um, so, so, so Katie has got a question for me how do you advise getting into presenting on television for documentaries etc my background is in drama and theatre. I'd like to move into the media and still utilise my speaking presenting skills. So, um, Katie, I did not intend to become a presenter. I was an accidental presenter. Um, I joined ITV News as a trainee back in 2007. Um, and I worked as a producer. I did reporting. I did a lot of background stuff. And then I did an audition for presenting in the studio. And it all sort of took off from there, something I really enjoy doing, um, but it wasn't the plan. Um, but, I'm, but I'm glad I learned production and journalism because that is the core of what I do and the presenting is in sort of an additional thing, um, if that makes sense. Um, so I think if you get into a newsroom and, you know, you enjoy the job, you enjoy what you're doing, um, then, you know, and there's, there's an opportunity to do some presenting, you, you just got to have the conversation when you're there. I think the main thing is to get into it. And, and I went in because I was interested in becoming a journalist and that sort of was a sort of, a sort of side effect of that. Um, but, you know, whatever you want to do, just go for it. That's what I would say. Um, so this is a question for Mel, Tracy or Isabel. So I'll let, I'll let you choose who wants to answer that. I was wondering, um, so no, hang on, this is a question for Isabel, sorry. I was wondering what a good career pathway for breaking into the script department ro for roles such as story editing or producing would look like. So what they mean is what kind of skills and experience or knowledge would a talent manager be looking for when recruiting for someone to work in their script department? Yeah, so, um... 
we do have assistant script editor opportunities that come up at Coronation Street and Emma Dale. So I would again advise keeping an eye out for those um, and applying for them when they do crop up. Um, in terms of skills, we do ask that you've had some kind of continuing drama experience and that you are really passionate about continuing drama. Um, so you need to show that in your application and um, in your covering letter. Um, and then also your CV as well and um, show us that you've had some kind of experience in continuing drama um, and that's where you see your career going um, and yeah I'd, I'd try and get some kind of entry level role that crops up within the script department they are really competitive um, but again you can show your passion for Coronation Street Emmerdale in your application and then also during the interview I think that really bodes well Obviously, you need a creative flair and um, kind of like a good knowledge of how of how soaps work. Um, so I hope, hope that helps. Okay, fantastic. Um, next question is from Lee, and it's open to every single one of you. So if you could all answer this question, actually, and we'll start with Mel. What single trait do you think is most important for someone to have? who's looking to get a foot in the door, who's looking to break into this industry? A single trait. Um, one trait. So if we all share one trait, we think... Yeah. Um, well, probably what you've already mentioned is, um, uh, I forget what the word is, but, you know, keeping on going at it, not giving up. Um, Persistence. Persistence, that's the word. <laughs> Fantastic, okay. Um, Isabel, what would you say? Um, probably can, can do attitude, just passionate can do attitude. And Tracy? You pinched my word there. I was going to say passion. <laughs> <laughs> it is that, is it, it is, I think that's really, I can't underline how important the passion is for everything surrounding TV production. And that includes watching TV. I know, realise that's not a single word. But, you know, if you watch TV and you come with a real interest, understanding, critique on, on, on the show, on a relevant show, that, that's great. None of that was one word, Tracy. <laughs> Lena. <laughs> Everything you guys said so far, and uh, as cheesy as it sounds, like positivity is so important because things do get hard on a production and... It's just, um, especially in casting, casting can be a very long process, but um, everything that you guys said can do attitudes, but positivity is so important. Yeah. And last but not least, David, what would you say? Uh, sorry to be boring, but I'd, I'd echo what everyone else has said. Um, I'd probably add to that though, um, kind of, I know it's been mentioned earlier actually, kind of having worked in a job that requires maybe like customer facing, you know like waitressing work in a shop something like that where you've got that kind of you know those built-in communication skills because i think it's sometimes overlooked that going into this industry there's so many people from so many different backgrounds all working together and as as lena said you know there can be some really long processes involved in this so communication is a really big one and being able to work with people you know kind of seamlessly from day one is, is so important Fantastic. Yeah, I think teamwork is really important, isn't it? Mal, what would you like to add? Sorry, just to add, I um, agree with what David's saying. And also, um, it's such a small world in the media that so many people know each other. Um, I mean, I used to work at ITV, you know, every, a lot of people know each other. So you need to, whatever role you do, even if you're doing a role where you're just making tea or whatever you're doing, do the best job that you can and be positive and be friendly and lovely with people. And feedback is all important because that feedback that you get for doing that might then get you the break that you're wanting. That's a really, that's really, really good advice actually. And I'm, I'll add to that, I interviewed um, one of ITV's uh, top executives um, last week. And um, she said, she said to me when she was a runner, um, she knew that her um, boss used to like a weak Darjeeling tea and she would make it for them before they even asked for it because she was just keen to make an impression. And she just said, st stay one step ahead all, all the time, stay one, you know, one step ahead to kind of 
be who, where you know be aware of where you want to go with this so just have lots of enthusiasm that's what i found anyway in gen, in journalism is you know to be really positive enthusiastic uh, and have that can do attitude and be persistent you know um so that's great advice ella brown is asking uh, would you suggest a different format of cv for journalism and a different one for broadcasting jobs or for a runner you know, or sort of like, or is one standardized CV okay? Who'd, who'd like to pick that up? Who looks at a lot of CVs in here? Shall I go for it? Yeah, well, yeah. maybe Tracy or Isabella want to answer it as well. But um, for, for me, I'd say that you should, you need to tailor the CV. I think Tracy said earlier, you need to tailor the CV full stop, whatever it is that you're applying for. So, um, as I mentioned, personal statement at the top, we um, often suggest that people put some skills underneath that and those skills should be specifically relevant to that specific job that you're applying for. Um, you need to tailor your CV, you need to also tailor it for which area, which genre you're looking, uh, you're applying to as well. So yeah, you, you need to do definitely tailor the CV to the role. That is really, really important. And Tracy, what would you say? I'd absolutely agree with that. Um, for me, the layout, the layout doesn't necessarily need to change, but just making sure that the content is, is tailored. So for a layout, for me, it's your name and contact details at the top. Um, and then underneath that, and some people say to put the, the job that you're applying for. So if you're a runner, you're going for running jobs, put that on there. Um, Underneath that's a profile of, if I read nothing else on that CV, I would get a real understanding of your skills and experience. And then the, the work experience under that, the, the employment history, is the evidence of what you've put in those bullet points. So if you, and I've literally just read one, if you put, I, I'm, um, I, I'm a, I work as a forward planning, AP or a uh, forward planner and then you don't refer to forward planning in your in your career history that that doesn't make sense so it's just making sure that what you're putting in your CV is backed up by evidence in the rest of your CV great stuff now um, th this is from someone who's living in the States uh, who has Canadian citizenship but would like to work in the UK they're asking the question, I don't know if Lena, you might be able to help with this, but do, do, do your companies prioritise local candidates over people who are from, from abroad? I'm sorry, I don't think I'm the right person. I know, I just realised yeah. that. Well, that's the question. You're, obviously, on the, you're yeah. obviously Canadian, but not necessarily. I'm Canadian and moved over <laughs> for a boy. That's the end of that. Okay. So, <laughs> but maybe someone from recruiting. Tracy or Mel, I'll, I'll put that to you. <laughs> Okay, so um, for the BBC, um, uh, I mean, I can't answer for all jobs across the BBC, but I would say that, um, you know, you need to look in the job advert quite often, um, even, obviously, I know a lot of work is done working from home, but there still might be a need, might be business need for the role, the person who gets the role to be based in um, Salford or you know wherever the role will be so um, even if some of it might be working from home that you might need to go into the office at some point so it, it might be that you'd need to um, you know be able to do that um, and I think I don't know this for sure but I think that if you're um, from abroad and you want to work for the BBC, I imagine that it would be sort of up to you to sort out the appropriate visa so that you're able to do that. Um, but don't hold me to that, but I think that is the way it works. So I think this person is looking to relocate to the UK and they're wondering more that do you have any, do you prioritise British people over a Canadian or an American person? No, not at all. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No, we, we welcome applicants from, from everybody. I mean, for a start, we, we also have the World Service at the BBC, which does have people who are internationally based. But if, peop if people are loca located in the UK, you know, if they can do the, if they've got the skills to do the job and the experience to do the job, you know, it, that is the, the thing that we're looking for, basically. Um, I'd just add that for us, um, we would need to see evidence of the right to work in the UK. OK, another question. Thank you. <laughs> 
Another question around diversity is disability seems to be an area that is underrepresented, that is lagging behind other underrepresented groups. Um, do you, what sort of challenges does this present to you when you're trying to look for talent and you're trying to kind of keep up with um, the sort of di demands of, you know, not the demands, but the kind of making sure you're representing all the different types of groups that are, that are in our communities? He wants to take that. That was just open to everyone. So I, I just want to add in terms of disability, ITV is a, a disability confident leader. So um, if you meet the minimum requirements of, of a role that's advertised on the ITV job site, you will be invited for an interview. So again, that kind of opens an opportunity um, to, to go for the role. Um, and I think it's it's a really positive way of, of increasing diversity for uh, disabled candidates. Um, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily answered the question. I just wanted to add that in there. <laughs> Sorry, would it be possible to hear the question again? I think I missed it. Yeah, the so the question is that, um, do you face any challenges if you're trying to, when you're trying to seek talent and especially around disability, um, you know, on screen or, you know, or behind the scenes. I think they're trying to find out that it's not, it's not, it's underrepresented, but do you face challenges in recruiting people with disabilities or do you actively do something to make that, make that happen? Um, I think uh, for us at the BBC, it's very important that um, we want to, with, if there are people applying who um, have disabilities, we would want to make it as, easy and accessible as possible for them so what i would say is if um somebody wants to apply for a role if they because i know sometimes it can be problematic for um people to apply online for certain roles so i would recommend that if uh, they you know do have any issues with applying for a role or they want any more support when applying for a role if they get in touch with the resourcing um, and talent people at the BBC uh, will do everything we can to support and um, assist them with their application because um, absolutely we want to do everything we can to um, to open our jobs up to to people to apply Okay, so we've only got 15 minutes left on this uh, on this seminar. So I'm going to try and get through a few many and we've got many more questions. Um, okay, so um, This is uh, When you refer to looking for talent on YouTube, so Or Instagram and TikTok, what kind of thing are you specifically looking for? So I David and Lena I remember you mentioning this at the beginning Yes, yeah, so um uh, when we're looking for, it really depends on what the brief is and what the format is. So um, we are currently working on a sex positive show, for example. So then that's the type of people who we would be looking for. We're all, we also have another money format. So again, we would be looking for that specific uh, it depends what the brief is and what we have really in production and um, and what's important from the BBC three perspective is really is that the, the person looks and feels like they'll naturally have the same tone that we would at BBC three. Do you want to add anything? Dave? What, what would that be then? What would be the tone and what is it? <laughs> what um, cheeky, happy, entertaining. Um, uh, confident, uh, very authentic, I would say, not not too polished. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd echo yeah. that. And, and I think it's tricky, really, to kind of say specifically, like, like Lena said, what we look for, because it does vary brief to brief, because, you know, you know, just last year we were kind of looking at a dating format, and then this year we've got our sex positive show, you know, it's kind of like more of a chat based, and then you've got kind of a money show as well in the work. So it does vary, but... Um, I think, yeah, the authenticity and, and kind of just being quite real, um, you know, a lot of the, specifically when we're looking for talent, I mean, obviously not, not speak from kind of Lena's department or anything, but I know specifically the talent we, we have looked for have organically built their kind of um, their status online through kind of like, uh, you know, posting a similar kind of thing subject wise that we're looking for. So it, it, it is really tricky to say, but I mean, we, in terms of kind of inspiration and stuff from, from my point of view anyway, in kind of post-production, I know that we, we do trawl 
kind of uh, lots of, uh, you know, individuals, YouTubes and, and Instagram pages for looking for cool ideas for things that, that we that we do, uh, with, whether it be the, the format of a show, the, the visuals of a show, you know, kind of the anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, we it's not just talent we look for. It's kind of everything. So and, and this kind of goes back to the point of how to stand out as a filmmaker as well, I think you know making things and putting yourself out there is the single biggest thing you can do if if you're you know if you've kind of got your what you know what you want to do and you know how to make it and you know you you, you just want to kind of do it you know eventually persistence does what does win and somebody will see it and i think that's such an important point is that people get so disheartened and kind of just try and pigeonhole themselves but actually if they just kind of almost own own their truth and make what makes them happy a lot of the times that actually ends up being the thing that makes them successful in, in the industry okay great advice thank you so much david um now this is going to be a question for everyone i think it might be it might even take us to the end but um so i'm going to start off with mel how did you enter the industry i'm going to go through everyone for this question okay so um i i entered the industry in a bit of a slightly different way than a lot of people probably um so i was a, a personal assistant for about nine years uh, and one of them the roles i did was as um a personal assistant to uh, the head of artists and music management at itv um, then i found out that um the bbc were moving up um and uh, I basically uh, went on the internet and um, applied to uh, join the BBC and I had to go through this um, big process. <laughs> um, and I was lucky enough to get a role as a team assistant. And then since then I um, did, uh, worked on programmes like Match the Day 2, Final Score, Football Focus, all of that, those kinds of things, the Six Nations as a production management assistant. Um, and then I became a staff scheduler, then I became a talent coordinator and now I'm the talent manager. So I kind of got in sort of through the back door by doing a personal assistant role in the first instance and that led to other things. <laughs> Interesting. And David, what about yourself? So uh, although I'm an editor at the moment, uh, my path to get here has been quite weird. So uh, I started off my first job in the industry. I was 16 and was a day runner on a Channel 4 show called Transmission with T-Mobile that was filming in the in the region with uh, Lauren Laverne and I think Steve Jones was presenting it. How did um, you get the job? How did you uh, get Yeah, I got well, I got the day job and then kind of um, they moved on. So they're touring around. But uh, then... I kind of went to college and university and kind of just tried to learn a lot of technical skills and, and you know, get my hands on kit and, and that kind of thing. And then I did a lot of work in kind of the corporate video space, making a lot of marketing materials for like business to business communications and stuff like that. Um, and on outside of that, I was then kind of a researcher and AP in documentaries, working on like shows with the ambulance service and the fire service, which is there is a lot of in the Midlands because of how big, our um, emergency services are here. We, I think a lot of, it's like the second outside of London in size. So a lot of uh, people film here for that stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, kind of editing all the while in the background in corporates. And then uh, two years ago, a job came up at BBC Three, which was uh, in the Edit Hub, which is kind of a bespoke department that makes a lot of short form social cuts to promote our bigger shows. Um, and I got a job there where I could kind of marry my editing skills from the kind of corporate world and my documentary skills from kind of, uh, you know, the kind of research AP side of things. And then um, kind of did a lot more editing there, built my skills up. And then I've had this, this staff editor job now for the last year. So kind of growing into the role. Um, so yeah, it has been a bit of a weird wavy path to get here. All right. Fantastic. And, and Isabel, what about yourself? Um, so once I graduated, I got a role as a personal assistant, uh, like Mel, um, but it wasn't in the industry. It was for someone who owned a super yacht technology company. Um, and while I was working as a PA, I saw a role at ITV on the ITV job site as a talent and crewing assistant. So um, I just applied for it and had transferable skills from the personal assistant role um, and then worked my way from being a talent and crewing assistant to being a talent coordinator and then a resourcing coordinator. And Tracy, what about yourself? 
I hate this question because I started about a million years ago <laughs> um, when all the terminology was different and <laughs> we had more money, I suppose. Um, so I started uh, and I didn't want to work in TV necessarily, but I was doing a secretarial course at, at, uni at um, college and I got work experience at the BBC. Um, didn't think I, and actually fair to say didn't think I would fit in at all um, and I did four weeks and absolutely loved it um, went back to my college course and was um, told about a job that was uh, on offer I went for it and I was successful and I, I, did, I did the opposite to Mel I started at the BBC in HR um, and worked my way up I did some secondments in production management um, so I think it's really good to have that understanding of how production works and then came to ITV uh, quite a while ago now. Okay. And Lena? I think I mentioned earlier, I just did a lot of work experience and bounced around a lot and, um, and then eventually got a break at a Birmingham Indie. And I just, I just want to say that once, once that happens, um, I think I think just take your time with everything like be a runner for as long as it takes to gain the experience to move up to junior researcher and like just do your time in those roles because whatever you pick up is so invaluable for when you kind of move up along the chain don't 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 speed it don't go from runner and then expect to be an ap like a year later because actually you should just enjoy the journey and just stick to it and and um, learn as much as you can because it will make you a better ap when you do eventually get there so fantastic advice that's great there's a question here specifically about production management master's courses so i'm going to put that to tracy how do production companies view these types of courses that are you know would, do you see them as a good thing are they necessary it's the same thing with any of the uh, qualifications that are on offer um, and that's that's from universities colleges and some of the third parties as well screen skills and and um rts and various other third parties channel four they, they are all really good to give you a good understanding, but it's up to you to decide whether you need to take that route or if there's a different route that you want to take. Um, they all offer really good advice. Uh, we work really closely with a lot of colleges, uh, universities and third parties um, and offer these sorts of um, outreach events, um, assessment days and various other things, whether they're right for you, only you can decide that. And there's another question about CVs. Um, is it worth adding hobbies onto a CV? So, so for example, somebody started their own podcast as a hobby and they're wondering whether is it, is it worth adding their hobbies, you know, Again, I think it's making sure these things have some relevance. So if you have done your paddy diving certificate and actually you need to film underwater somewhere, that's really relevant. Podcasts increasingly relevant. And just want to say, you know, going back to careers, mine doesn't really matter. It's so important. Lena and, and David, particularly in the creative uh, editorial side of the and craft skills it's so important with new technology um, in constantly changing that you're keeping on top of that and any hobbies around that can only be a good thing so uh, thank you for that so there's uh, another question for myself so I'm just going to answer this as well what entry-level roles and jobs would you suggest trying to find to get your first job into a newsroom so like uh, I'm just going to echo what others have said here work experience work experience work experience the more you get in a radio news newsroom or in a television newsroom 
in a newspaper um, newsroom, it just, the more work experience you get, the more enthusiasm you show, that just gets you known and then hopefully will lead to job opportunities. So people have transferred from radio into television broadcasting. In addition to that, I did a, I did a psychology degree to begin with, and then I did a postgraduate diploma in broadcast journalism in Birmingham. Um, so that was like a six month additional course, but it helped because I did media law. I learned about radio. I learned about TV a little bit, but it was the traineeship with ITV that really helped me um, understand the industry properly. But work experience is the first step to getting your foot through in the door and then doing a course on top of that, if you can, helps. And then these apprenticeships and training schemes, I think are fantastic in terms of developing your skills uh, and becoming an all rounder. So um, there is another production manual. We've got just one minute left. Um, what relevant, Tracy, this is for you. What relevant work experience do you think people should get who are looking to doing a production management course at Salford University um, in t TV and film? And they want, they want to become a production manager. And you're, and you're wondering what type of work experience, any entry level work experience, as I said earlier, it's just really important get, to get a good understanding of production. Um, and if you move into the production management side of things, I would say, and I, 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 we're, very quickly, as somebody who was a runner for many years, a couple of years, and we couldn't work out why she was a runner for a couple of years. And we kept saying, well, do you want your first research job? How about being a researcher? It turned out she wanted to work in production management and she's a brilliant production manager now. So just get a broad range of experience. Be clear and sure that you're, co you're going down the, the right career path for you. Um, and uh, yeah, a, a, just a wide variety of experience to start with. Right, that's, that brings us to a close now. Thank you so much to everyone. You guys have been fantastic. Lots of, um, you know, good advice and tips there. And hopefully the people who've been part of this session have found that useful. So thank you so much. <laughs>